Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of the Articulate Fly, and we're back with another Matt the Hatch with Matt Green. How you doing, Matt? How's it going, Marvin? Good to be with you after Thanksgiving. Absolutely. I'm doing well. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah, yeah. It's a little social distance, a little different than normal, but can't complain. Well, good. And are you getting ready for Santa Claus? Oh, man, of course I am. (laughs) <laughs> Santa Paws, too. You can't forget about Santa Paws and Santa Claus. Oh, there you Claus. go. <laughs> the kitty version. There you yeah. go. And so I guess the topic for the day is going to be winter stoneflies. Right, right. These are insects that are emerging right now in the mountains and our Piedmont streams. They're not really found in the coastal plain all that much. I mean, I, I don't really ever read of any occurrences outside of the Piedmont, but in small springs and smaller, what are we called, fourth, second, or even third order, order is just based on the size of the stream. In the Piedmont and the mountains, you're going to find these guys and probably some of the larger rivers in the, in the mountains. But our rivers in the Piedmont are just too silty and sediment rich to have good populations of these guys and they prefer really clean colder water yeah it's interesting matt i've always thought about that and kind of been told that finding stoneflies meant that you had really good cold clean water yeah yeah i mean especially these guys so we have about 10 genera in north america and three of those genera here in the southeast usa those are paracapnea Nemocatnia and Alicatnia, and there are about 40 plus species of winter, small black, tiny winter stoneflies in the southeast USA. And you know, it's interesting, you, you have to come up with generic adult and nymphal patterns to imitate 40 plus species. That's, that's a lot of variation that you would be reasonably expected to imitate, but you really don't have to do that in the end. Um, just a little bit more about these guys. They're hemimetabolists. That means they have an incomplete life history. They go from an egg phase, a larval or a nymph phase, and to an adult phase. And one cool thing about the larvae or the nymphs of these insects is they undergo what's called a hypermetamorphic period. They actually live in the hyperreic regions of streams. And most fly fishermen won't know what this is, but this is just a, an area of the stream that's underneath the sediment. It's underneath the cobble that receives groundwater intrusion. And the groundwater uh, layer and the stream running water layer are actually pretty close <laughs> in a lot of streams. Most folks don't know that, but it's an early in-store, early developmental Larva. So these are just really small larvae. They live in that hyperreic region through the summer, through the early fall, and then after leaf drop, mid late fall, they come out of that layer and undergo hypermetamorphosis. And they feed on the deciduous leaf litter of fallen leaf detritus, and that's when they really start to grow quickly. And these uh, these larvae by that period are anywhere from about a size 24 to 20 hook. Uh, They're real skinny. They're tan to pinkish tan pale cream. And that's a really weird color combination. You wouldn't think many larvae are actually pink, but they have a slight pink tint to them. They have different worm-like markings on them when you find them. And, you know, late in the fall or even through the winter, if you just take some of that leaf detritus, that leaf material that's been deposited from the riparian or the you know, the zone, you know, the, uh, the um, um, tree and woody plant layer that's right next to the stream, it's inputting leaves. If you look for those leaves in the stream, you might find these guys in the winter. Given that small size, is it something that you can kind of cheat and imitate with a midge larva? You could, but you can also do it with just a nymph tied in the same way. Just give it a little bit more legs. You can you can uh, palmer some hackle around where the head or thorax of the insect would be on the imitation. And then you can use a dubbing brush to kind of make that more ragged and 
you can do that on a Mitch Law run that might do the trick. Um, but really, it's a, it's a color thing, I think, for the most part. If you can find a way to get a little pink into sort of a light tan or cream-colored nymph or midge larva, you're really going to hit the, the nail on the head with this thing. I mean, And you want to be fishing these larvae, um, these nymphs, as they're emerging through the, through the late fall and early winter and then midwinter and then late winter. Uh, in and around rocks or um, larger cobble boulders in the stream because these stoneflies are actually migrating to those areas and then walking out of the water on top of those uh, those uh, boulders to emerge. And they'll actually leave their exuvi or exoskeleton behind. And so if you're walking along streams or rivers and you see these really small, what look like Remnant shucks or exoskeletons of insects that might have been a small black winter stonefly, but more likely at that point you might also see the stonefly itself because they tend to hold on to these rocks for warmth. You know, it's cold out there. They they get a little bit of warmth from the rocks due to solar radiation. And it's it's interesting too. You'll often see them on snow after snowfalls an extra streams and rivers. And that's because the snow is actually taking in a lot of solar radiation as well. And it's actually fairly warm oh, just right on top of that snow. And they're, they're getting some heat from that. Uh, the adults, and uh, as I've said probably in a previous post, are black with a gray, light gray to slightly white wings. Uh, the males and females are slightly different. The females have wings that cover all the way to the end of the abdomen. They're a little bit larger than the males, anywhere from the size 22 to 18. Uh, the males have wings that stop about, a, about halfway down the abdomen to three quarters of the way down the abdomen, range from a size 24 to a 22 or 20. And, you know, you, you see folks out there, oh, I'm fishing 26, blah, blah, blah. You might actually have to fish a 26 because once you add floatant, that fly just appears a little bit larger to the fish than it would without. And so the true insect is probably at smallest a 24 in a male or a 22 in a female, but you might have to fish it a size smaller if you're adding lots of floatant. Now, if you're taking a piece of piece of cloth or a, um, a napkin of some sort and you're constantly dabbing that fly dry and then refishing it which is what I would recommend for something like this where you're fishing right on the film because these insects are, are, are so skinny and, and their abdomens are so thin they're just like a like a small twig or something like that floating down the film that's how they, that's how close they are to the surface film they're only about two or three millimeters at most above the film and so really you don't want to add all that much hackle to the fly any kind of cdc you had make sure you trim it down and whether you use floating is really up to you but i don't recommend it because you're just going to be fishing a fly that appears too big to the trout or the fish you're trying to catch. And, you know, these trout and other fishes that eat these things through the winter, especially in the mountains, are sipping these catnead, these small black winter stoneflies off the surface. And you fish them much like you would a midge, kind of fishing it on a tight line, lizard ring lift technique kind of rising and lifting the rod tip right in the face of the fish to lift a strike, kind of imitating some sort of movement on the surface. And these, these little black stone plays will move on the surface, especially in a warm day. Yeah, interesting too. And I guess, you know, you also get to how, how can you see it? So it sounds like you probably need to fish it either maybe behind um, like a New Zealand strike indicator or maybe like a parachute atom that's kind of small or a blue-winged olive just so you kind of have a little bit of an idea of where your fly is. Yeah, definitely you could do that. I mean, that's not a bad idea. Uh, certainly 
these these stone flies are going to be emerging in cloudy days and sunny days, so you may or may not have the light at your advantage to help you see those insects on the surface better and your imitations fishing them. So, yeah, you could certainly use a, a little bit of a larger fly in the back or in the front, to, uh, depending on you know, what depth you're wanting to fish the insect of your, you know, your, your target insect, this being the, the tiny black stone fly. I mean, you, and you could fish two at a time. I mean, there's, there's no reason you couldn't fish two of these guys at a time and kind of swing them like small soft tackles. And my, my imitations generally in the past have been one wrap of grizzly to black hackle at the top with a uh, kind of a gray or white duck mallard wing tied over a thread body. And so um, you have this kind of a wet fly-like appearance to the fly with two tails or maybe some Cersei in the back, but that's really for that stylistic. I don't think the fish really are going after tails on these small insects. They're much more concerned about where you're fishing them on the surface and then how they appear. Are they too large or are they too small? It's, it's really kind of an imitation of winter trico fishing. You know, any good trico fisherman in, up in the northeast or out west is going to say, oh, too big is too big, too small is too small. This, you know, how big the fly appears to the fish and how, um, how the size of that fly compares to the natural insect means, means the world with this small insect fishing, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so how long do you expect the emergence to last into the winter, Matt? Oh, it'll probably go uh, until early February in the mountains, maybe mid-February, really depending on the temps. If it stays cold, it may be lengthened out a little bit more. If it gets warmer, it may fizzle out by mid-February. In the Piedmont, it should go until early March or so. Um and you can fish them in the Piedmont. I've I've done it myself. <laughs> it's possible, for sure. Uh, panfish, um, other small smaller uh, game fish coming up for them. And one thing I will add, Marvin, is that normally you you mark the end of this little black stonefly emergence, the mountains in particular with the beginning of a mid February, early March emergence of a uh, tiny opteryx, which is this larger black winter stone fly that people, some folks say, hey, that's my first uh, um, emergence on fishing of the uh, new season, so to speak. And then they'll, you know, and that clears the way for, for most of the April um, and May spring emergences, including a couple of those in March here in the southeast. Yeah, very neat. And, you know, folks, we love questions on the Articulate Fly. If you have a question for Matt, you can email them to us or send them to us on our Facebook or Instagram page, and we're happy to work them into the next Matt the Hatch with Matt Green. Well, listen, Matt, I don't know if I'll talk to you again before Christmas, and uh, I hope you have a merry one. Yeah, sure thing, Marvin. I'd, I'd really like to do another hatch report at some point, and then we can talk a little bit more about uh, an insect that we mentioned briefly in our previous podcast, Dolophilotus distinctus, which is this winter caddis fly whose females are actually wingless. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. And listen, folks, you know, get out there and fish. The only thing I kind of know for sure is that it's much more likely to be warmer in December than it will be in January and February. Tight lines, everybody. Tight lines, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Marvin. Thanks, Marvin.